when we hear that the Buddha taught the path to the unconditioned, one of our first thoughts is that he's going to do away with our social conditioning. But actually it's something a lot more radical than that. But he will try to make use of our social conditioning. After all, when he taught the Dharma, he used language. And he did insist that his language was the only one that Dharma could be taught in. A group of monks one time decided to turn his teaching into a Veda, which would have made it exclusive property of the Brahmins. He found out about this and said, no, everyone should memorize the Dhamma in his or her own language. So he wants us to use our conditioning, simply to use it in a new way. He does talk of the customs of the Noble Ones, as we chanted just now. And they're customs that go against a lot of the customs of the world, customs we've learned from our parents, we've learned from schools, we've learned from the media. But it is a kind of acculturation, because the mind works with its conventions, it works with its conditions. And the Buddha is basically giving you new conditions for the purpose of putting into suffering. As he said, the purpose of our thinking is to put it into suffering. This is why we start thinking to begin with. If we didn't have any suffering, who would think? You just bliss out. We start thinking, we start talking, because we're suffering, and then we get waylaid. We start looking into other issues and have ideas of other responsibilities, other duties that we have to take on depending on our culture. His culture, though, is a culture with one big aim. And that's to put an end to suffering. We see this in the four customs of the noble ones we chanted just now. We learn to be content with whatever food, clothing, or shelter we have. As long as it's good enough to practice, it's good enough. Because if you start wanting more than that, it cuts into your time to practice, cuts into your values. But the Buddha was subtle enough to see that even that can become a source of defilement. You may be proud of the fact that you're more content with little than other people. So as you said, you're sensitive to the dangers in using things, how the mind can create defilements even around this. You learn to let that go. Then the fourth custom, you delight in developing and delight in abandoning. Here it says you delight in developing skillful qualities and abandoning unskillful ones. The unskillful ones include your cravings. Now there are skillful desires, but the cravings that go deep are a craving for sensuality, craving to take on an identity in a world of experience. Or if you've got an identity you don't like, you try to, you crave to destroy it. All those things, the Buddha said, lead to suffering. And the problem is we like them, and the cultures in which we grow up tend to emphasize these things so much of. Any culture is around sensual pleasure, indulging in sensual desires, and in taking on identities within that culture. And then you have duties based on who you are within that culture. The Buddha is trying to give you a different set of duties. And so he looks deeply into the issue. It's not just culture. The conditioning that he's talking about, and when we're trying to go beyond conditioning, is the fact that in anybody who's going to have an experience it's going to make any sense. It's going to be composed of those three kinds of fabrication that he said, when they're based on ignorance, it's going to lead to suffering. There's bodily fabrication, which is your in and out breath. Verbal fabrication, your direct of thought and evaluation, the way you talk to yourself, choosing your topics and then making comments on them. And then mental fabrication, perceptions, which are the labels you hold in mind, 
and then your feelings, feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. These are the things we use to shape our experience. In fact, even before we have sensory experience, we're already shaping experience in these ways. So that when something comes in by where the eyes, ears, nose tongue, nose, tongue, and body, or the mind, the mold in which those things are going to be squeezed has already been set. And that's the conditioning the Buddha wants to change by giving us new conditioning. Recommends new ways of breathing. Breathe in a way that, one, you just pay a lot of attention to your breath. And then, two, you learn how to breathe in ways that give rise to rapture, give rise to pleasure. Breathe in ways that gladden the mind, concentrate the mind, that are conducive to releasing the mind. Things that we usually don't think about. But he says, if you pay attention to your breath, it has lots of potential. And it's going to have an impact on the mind. New ways of talking to yourself. Well, first to get the mind into concentration. Usually with our thinking it's to find something else to comment on this in the world, these things in the world. But here's the Buddha saying, talk to yourself about the breath. Talk to yourself about the breath in a way that helps the mind to settle down so the mind and the breath fit together nicely. Now, so the breath is calm enough so it has a calming effect on the mind. But not so subtle that you you lose you lose focus. The subtlety of the breath will develop as your powers of concentration get stronger, and you can be with more and more subtle breathing. But in the beginning, it is important that you watch out. If it gets too subtle, you tend to drift. There's a sense of ease or well-being. You tend to drop the breath and just wallow in the ease, wallow in the well-being. So you've got to watch out for that. You have to learn how not to be, as the Buddha said, overcome by pleasure. The pleasure is there. The Buddha doesn't try to have you deny pleasure. In fact, it was the discovery of the pleasure of concentration that he realized that was going to be the heart of his path. But you have to learn how to relate to it properly. And that's where the perceptions come in. How do you picture the breath to yourself? We have so many perceptions, so many labels we picked up from the, our time in whatever society we've grown up in. And we have some cartoon ideas about how the breath works, but you have to examine them. Some of them are helpful and some of them are not. So the Buddha talks about the breath as part of what he calls the wind element in the body. That should alert you right there. We're not talking about the air coming in and out through the nose. We're talking about the flow of energy in the body. Now, how does it flow? When you breathe in, where does the in-breath seem to start? And when you breathe in, how do you know that you've breathed in enough? And part of the mind will say, well, we just let the body breathe on its own. It can do it. But what happens there is you have old, habitual ways of breathing which may or may not be conducive to a sense of pleasure inside. So look at your perceptions around the breath. Get to know them really well, so you have a sense of what kind of breathing, way, what way of visualizing breathing to yourself helps you maintain a sense of fullness, even as you breathe out. Think of the breath flowing down through the nerves, flowing down through the blood vessels, out to every pore. Expand your range of awareness, expand the range of your perception, your mental image of the breath. So you see it as a whole body process, and you're sensitive to the whole body. So in these ways the Buddha's giving you a new way to condition your experience in line with the values of the customs of the Noble Ones, the culture of the Noble Ones, which, unlike the cultures of the world, is designed specifically to put an end to suffering. Now, eventually you go beyond even that culture. 
as the Buddha said, with the path. The path takes you to the goal, but it's not the goal itself. And there are some points where you have to let go of it to get to the goal. But before you let go, you develop it. Then you do it through this conditioning, the conditioning in terms of the way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself, the images you hold in mind to create feelings of well-being. So you can be more and more centered right here and see the mind in action. That's what this is all about. To watch your mind in action. As you said, the Dharma is found by committing yourself and then reflecting. You commit yourself to getting the mind to settle down, and then you reflect on the mind settle down. When it's settled down, is it totally without stress, or is there still some level of stress in there? And you find there are subtle levels here and there. Look for the ones that are caused by what the mind is doing, how the mind is picturing things to itself. How it's talking to itself. In what ways you can make it even more subtle. In this way your conditioning is heading toward the end of suffering. Now as I said, the culture of the noble ones is countercultural wherever it goes. In India it was countercultural. In Thailand, when Ajahn Mun decided he wanted to follow the way to, to awakening, he was accused of deviating from Thai culture. Here in the West, again, the Buddhist values are very counterculture, but they're healthy, and they do lead to the end of suffering. So we respect the values we picked up from our parents, we respect the values we learned from society, but we also learn when to put them aside. So we take advantage of the conditioning that the Buddha recommends. So when he directs us to the unconditioned, it's not simply to get rid of our old social conditioning. It's help us to help us get beyond the way we condition every present moment. It's that radical. So pay close attention to how he recommends that you fabricate your present experience. Because it's aimed in the direction of going beyond all fabrication and all conditions, even going beyond the present moment. I want you to do that thorough a job. <laughs>